Hello, everybody in the room, and hello, everybody who's watching this from somewhere else. If you don't mind, I'm going to take off my mask, but I promise to use proper social distancing, if that's all right. So what we have up on the board here, the goals that we've set for today's meeting, and broadly, that's to share information about the city of Fort Worth, discuss the budget policies, financial management policies, philosophies, the budget process, and give some context to the upcoming fiscal year budget that we'll talk about the capital budget next week on Tuesday, and then we'll present the recommended operating budget the following Tuesday on August 11th. It's also a forum to be able to answer questions you might have about any of those things that we covered today about the budget process or the budget. And there's other folks here in the room to help me. They're from the manager's office, the finance office, and the department that we call planning and data analytics that uh, helps put together the city's budget. What I'll try to do as we go through some of these slides is break at certain points just to see if there's questions on the material that we covered up to that point in time. And again, I think I could say that there will be a phone number where people can text in questions, they can call in questions, email in questions, and if you're in the room, I think you could write them down and Michelle is collecting those, right? All right, ready to get started? Oh, I didn't even introduce myself, I'm sorry. David Cook, city manager. Um, and this will be, I think, the sixth or seventh budget that I'll present to the city council uh, next week. So the first thing I wanted to do is put the city in the context of all the different things we do. I think there are some specific things we'll want to talk about today. And there's some things that we don't usually talk about because they're either not in the news, I don't want to say people take it for granted, but they're things that we go about our daily lives and we count on these things happening, but we don't think about the financial, uh, let's say the uh, business of these things. So let's start out with many of the things that the city does. The first thing I put up there is we run a regional water and sewer utility. So we provide water and sewer to not only the city of Fort Worth, but to many other municipalities in the area, both on the water side and on the sewer side. And when you think about that business, if you're paying for water and sewer, you do that through water and sewer rates, right? You get a monthly bill on water and sewer. You generally know what you use, but it's a big operation. It's hundreds of millions of dollars a year in capital infrastructure. And to take that a little bit farther, if you think about a regional water and sewer utility, most of it is under the ground, right? It's water lines, it's sewer lines, probably literally hundreds or thousands of miles of that infrastructure. And so when we also talk about budgeting and the financial stuff that the city has to think about, I want you to think about the infrastructure that the city has to provide too. Right, So the infrastructure that we not only have to build as we're expanding, but the infrastructure that we have to maintain after it is built. All right. Next up is we are responsible for three general aviation airports. We have, everybody knows where Meacham is, off of North Main Street. We have Sphinx down in the far south. And then we have Alliance Airport, which is up in the far north side of, of the city. And so these three airports also run like a business, right? The revenue streams for the airports are paid for by the people that are leasing hangars or leasing space at those airports, buying gas at the airport, landing fees that uh, they have to pay for to take off and land at the airport. And so those businesses, and they have to maintain that infrastructure too, which could be taxiways or runways or hangars and other facilities. 
We have the convention center that we operate in the Will Rogers complex. That primarily is funded from hotel tax, right? So it's not property tax, it's not sales tax. It's predominantly paid for by hotel taxes and other what I'd call tourism related revenues. We'll get into this a little bit later, but I want you to think about COVID and what hotels did after we shut down the economy, most of the hotels closed. So think about the hotel revenue that doesn't exist to go toward the convention center and the Will Rogers complex. Again, the infrastructure for both of those, you think about the convention center, it's a big building, not only to maintain, but we were in the process of talking about expanding it at the time that the economy took a little hit. Next is golf, we have golf courses, we operate three. Three golf courses, Rockwood just got an upgrade. I knew if I started doing this, I'd forget them. Rockwood, Meadowbrook, Pecan Valley. Uh, same thing, if you use the uh, golf courses, you're paying for those. But I will tell you that the general fund does subsidize the golf courses because they don't run on a break-even basis. Next up is a stormwater utility. Uh, again, that's to prevent flooding, to mitigate flooding. Uh, that's been in place for, the utility's been in place for a number of years, and we just increased the stormwater utility fee this past January. The reason that we increased the fee for the stormwater was we believe we need to spend more money on capital infrastructure to mitigate flooding in the city, and so that rate increase was primarily attributed to paying for future bonds to build infrastructure to mitigate the flooding in the city. We run parking facilities, some by the convention center, some by Dickey's Arena and the Will Rogers complex. Again, users pay for the use of the parking. Um, and then finally, I showed up there, we have a solid waste collection system and a landfill that we operate. The solid waste collection is essentially every resident or household in the city pays a monthly fee for garbage collection. And the landfill, uh, again, that's there to take care of the waste for many, many years. The other thing I would wanna stress on some of these when we think about these other businesses Many of these departments that run these businesses have long-term financial plans, master plans. It takes decades to site and build a landfill. It takes decades to site and build a wastewater treatment plant or a water treatment plant. And we're in the process of a wastewater treatment plant right on the western side of the city and we've been at that for almost 20 years, if I remember correctly. And so one of the reasons to saying that, we'll talk about the budget. The budget is not just the one year incident. The budget is about thinking about how the city ought to run and what services we ought to provide over a long period of time, right? So as we talk about, and we'll get more into the budgets, just the different things that the city do, does, many of these things take years of planning, years of financing in order to get them in place. Now let's turn to the general fund, because this is what most people think about when they think about the city. This is where your property tax money is, and this is where the sales tax money is primarily, and we'll use some charts in a second. So when you think about the services that we provide that come out of the general fund, we got parks, we got libraries, we have municipal court. I won't read them all, but please fire, a diversity inclusion, neighborhood service, development services, transportation and public works. We have some of the same issues that we showed you in those other businesses, right? Except these businesses all compete for the same dollars, right? The water and sewer utility kind of operates independently. 
right? So it charges water and sewer revenues, but it's got to pay for its infrastructure, it's got to pay for its services. The stormwater utility is a separate fee that's put on businesses and homeowners, right? It doesn't compete against the water department and it doesn't compete against these businesses right here. But each of these businesses compete for the same resources that come out of the general fund. Does that make sense? All right. And again, these departments, many of these departments will have multi-year master plans, because again, think about how you site and build a park or how you build roads, new roads in the city, which is transportation and public works. Some of that takes years to plan, design, acquire property, and build that infrastructure. So I thought I'd show you, this is the current year budget. This is pre-COVID, right? So, and this is just operating dollars, not capital. So we spend approximately $1.8 billion in all those different businesses that we just talked about. And so when you think about the general fund, remember all those departments that compete for the same resources, that's roughly 707 million of the $1.8 billion. Now if we go to the general fund, and in the general fund I'll show you both um, the revenues and expenditures. So when we think about the general fund, the property tax makes up about 55%. And sales tax makes up another 24.4. So if you put those together, what do we got? 79, right? So nearly 80% of the general fund is from two sources, property tax and sales tax. And that's the, when you think about it, that's the tax that most homeowners and most businesses think about. How much am I gonna to have to pay in property taxes for all those things that I want or need from the city of Fort Worth? We've shown what some of the other revenue streams are, but I just show this to give you the magnitude of what the property tax and the sales tax make up. So here's the expenditure side. And I previously showed you some of those departments or businesses that compete for that money. And clearly the largest two departments for property tax and sales tax is police and fire. Police being clearly the largest at 38% of the general fund. And then the fire department, which is another 23%. And these slides and everything will be available on the website, right, Michelle? So uh, if you want to, I was just, you were taking pictures, and I'm okay with that too, but I want you to know you can have all this stuff. Um, now the police department, just a little uh, tangent here, the police department also has the CCPD budget, which is not part of the general fund, right? So there is another part of the police budget that comes out of CCPD that is not shown in this chart, okay? This might be a good time to stop real quick just to see if there are any questions on the stuff that we've covered so far. There's more that I'm gonna jump into that I'm sure will generate questions, but I just think this might be a good time. Michelle's gonna give me the go ahead or you good? Go ahead. Uh, since that is in golf courses, is there, is, is there a return the city gets from that? Or? So let me, let me help describe it. Um, so we run those three golf courses, and I would tell you that we get enough revenue from those golf courses generally to cover operating expenses. But if you had to say, can I generate enough money to pay for the capital and some of the capital maintenance, then the answer is no. And that's where the subsidy comes from. 
I'll also take you back to the, um, in 2014, the city had a bond referendum, and parks included the improvements to Rockwood Golf Course, right? So that got paid out of a bond program, which is, I'll talk in a few minutes about how that's supported. But yes, so there's still a subsidy going to, and the thought process is, could we charge more? Yeah, we could probably charge more. But then the thought is then we price people out, right? So if we want to make golf available to more people, then some of the reason that's why you price it that way. Yes. The police has the majority of the budget, uh, 38%, and then they also have the CCPD fund. Why is there so much money in that, those particular budgets for police? We have two budgets for police. So I'm going to answer that in, in, as we go forward, if you don't mind. I'm going to hold off on that one. I'll make sure I cover that. Yes. So, I have one more question. So I know you said all departments compete for the same funds. Will you be talking about how, what that process looks like? like yeah. yeah. What happens when there's a, a surplus? Let's say the fire department has you know, 150 million and they only spend 2040. What happens to that 20 million? So let me. Uh, the question is, what happens if there's a surplus? And so we track budgets throughout the year. Um, and I'll just use this past year as an example, right? Our fiscal year is October to September. So we're doing the budget now for the year that's going to begin October 1. And so when the fiscal year ends, then we look at how all departments have spent their money during the year. And it's a no-no to overspend. Right? So we're okay that you underspend. Right? And we look at, there's two things we look at. How did we estimate revenues? So going back to this slide, did we hit our revenue estimates? Because we might have a surplus because we collect more revenue than we estimated. Right? We want to end the year with either excess revenues are unspent expenditures or both, right? So we, we want that to occur. And what happens is it goes to our total reserves or what we call fund balance. And what I'm gonna tell you is, well, I'll do it now and talk about it a little bit more later. As the city grows, it's likely that our budget's gonna grow. As our budget grows, we need our reserves to grow as a proportion of the total. Does that make sense? So we need that to occur year over year so that we don't have to try to create reserves through some other method. That we want it to occur by either underestimating revenues or saving on the expenditure side. Okay? All right. We'll come back to the uh, police and a little bit on the process. So just from a policy or a philosophy standpoint, here are some things that we keep in mind as we prepare a recommended budget, as we work with departments throughout the year. Oh, and the other thing I should have covered most of those businesses that you saw, the regional water and sewer utilities, stormwater utility, they all have citizens advisory committees. The library, parks and recreation, uh, diversity and inclusion. And so there are citizen groups that work in an advisory capacity with these departments throughout the year. And normally what we've done over the last five years is we convene the advise, citizen reps from the advisory committees as part of a stakeholder process to walk through the budget process. And admittingly, we didn't do that this year with the COVID and the uh, uh, shutdown of the, everybody stay at home and do those things. So we didn't do that stakeholder process this year, but we normally engage the citizens from those different advisory committees in that process and usually what they're giving advice on is the stuff that they're related to. So you'll hear the Library Commission talk about the importance of libraries. You'll hear the 
Parks and Rec Advisory Board talked about the importance of parks and rec and open space. And so there is some citizen participation as that occurs because of all the different advisory committees that are on there. But going back to the long-term perspective, the other thing that we try to keep in mind by having a long-term perspective is the city is growing by about 15 to 20,000 people each year, all right? So at the end of five years, we might be adding nearly 100,000 people. And I have you think about what does the infrastructure look like for a town of 100,000 people? And we do that every five years. And so if we wait to do things, I argue it's going to be too late, right? And some of the people will argue that we're too late on some of the road infrastructure. We're too late on some of the affordable housing. We're too late on, and so that's again why I think we have to have that long-term perspective and to be looking out, because if we're not planning for that infrastructure and 15 to 20,000 people are coming every year, we're going to be behind the eight ball, on particularly on an infrastructure side. The second one up there is maintaining the property tax rate or reducing the property tax rate. And we've had a policy and a philosophy for a number of years that if growth could accommodate it, meaning the assessed value going up, that we're going to meet the needs as we see them and drop the tax rate. And I'll show you there's some slides as we move forward that we've dropped the tax rate. And it is my belief, our belief, that at one time our tax rate was too high. We had the highest property tax rate of any major city in Texas. Now we don't get to say that anymore, partly because we brought the tax rate down, but some would say it's still too high to be competitive particularly on a business front, if you're tr trying to attract or recruit businesses, and if cost of business is an important issue. The third bullet, uh, again, we've talked about, we're trying to, and have been for a number of years, emphasizing infrastructure and maintenance of the infrastructure that we build, and no use of reserves for operation, that should be opposite, I mean, obvious if we do that, Again, we're just, it's a short-term fix to a long-term problem. This phrase that we use, capital plan drives the operating budget. If we put before the voters that we're going to build a library, then we're going to build a library. And if we build a library, we're going to staff it. And we're going to maintain it from that point forward. So we know that if we build a fire station, or we build a library, or we build a rec center, or we build a neighborhood center, that creates operating costs that we have to be able to put into the budget without raising the tax rate and doing those things. So the idea is, in many ways, and you'll see that the capital budget sometimes drives the operating budget because it creates things that have to be put into the budget. Data-driven decisions, that's clearly a focus. What is it that we're trying to achieve? Why is it important? What are the outcomes? And so focusing on not just that we're spending $1.8 billion, but what are we getting from the $1.8 billion? Is it the things that we are wanting to get from that expenditure of money? You know, to me, the budget is a big deal because it shows how you spend money. Not just how you spend money, but how you allocate resources that are finite, right? Because you, you can't, it's not unlimited. Sometimes this is when I make fun of the federal government. You don't, we don't get to print money. We actually have to balance the revenues with the expenditures. And those, you've heard me say the last two are just in the general fund, everything's competing against everything. So if I spend a dollar in parks and rec, it's a dollar that I cannot spend in libraries, or if I spend a dollar in police, that's a dollar we can't spend in neighborhood services, right? That's why choices have to be made, trade-offs have to be made as part of that budget process. 
Now, part of our process in the city, and we do this every February, is we have a city council planning retreat again every February. And the purpose, there's several purposes in it, and we'll usually have a key topic, but we do these same things all the time. We're going to forecast what the next year's budget's going to look like. We're going to telegraph what we think the revenues are going to be. We're going to telegraph what we know our expenditures and our commitments to be. And then we're going to give you know, some telegraphing of you know, how we might prioritize if there's some money available for other initiatives. So we do the general fund forecast. We do the CCPD forecast. This last year, we have to talk about our solid waste fund because our solid waste fund is not sustainable over the long term, meaning the current fee structure that we charge for households and the money we collect at the landfill is not sufficient to pay for the expenditures that are being spent out of that fund. So it's one of the things that we've talked about with the city council, with some of the advisory committees of what we've got to fix. And so that's something we have to fix in the upcoming fiscal year. The other thing we got to talk about is you may know that a new state law was put into place that caps the city's revenue. Right, so the state decided that I guess local governments were spending too much property tax money. So they put into place a property tax revenue cap that allows us to capture any new development that occurs from one year to the next, so that doesn't count against us. But the rest of the properties can only go up 3.5%. Right, so essentially, it's a 3.5% cap, but we get new growth. Uh, I'll talk about the 21 budget and then as we get toward the end, we're the cap's not going to uh, hit us this year because the economy tanked. It's not the right reason, but that cap won't impact us this year. So this again is to give a historical perspective on the property tax rate. And so let me walk you through it. It goes back to 2011. And then it goes through the current fiscal year. The O&M is operation and maintenance. So we break the tax rate up into O&M and debt. Now we break it up into three categories. O&M, what we call pay-as-you-go, which is simply cash funding capital. Right? So it's funding capital, but using cash. So back in 2011, a citizens advisory group got put together and it was related to transportation infrastructure and they said to the city council, you're not spending enough money on capital. The roads stink, you're not spending enough money on maintaining, we're not keeping up with the growth. And so you'll see back then that the city put more money each year of this same tax rate the tax rate didn't change, but the amount that went to debt to pay for capital went up each of those years. You see that? And then the city had a bond referendum in 2014, and the city was able to say we can do this bond program without raising property taxes because essentially they had already shifted some of the tax rate from operating to debt. Now, what we've been trying to do over the last five years is, because of the policy, we need to be spending more on infrastructure and maintenance. We've been trying to put more into debt and pay as you go. And my goal, our goal, is that 30% of our tax rate should go to capital. If you're a growing city, if you're a stagnant city that doesn't grow, you don't need to allocate that much of the tax rate for infrastructure. But if you're a growing city of 15 to 20,000 people a year, you need to allocate a portion of that tax rate for that infrastructure. And so our goal, and we're pretty close, I mean, I think we're satisfied with 
being where we are now. So 30% of the tax rate goes to capital, either debt or cash. Now the other goal is, if you just look at your capital side, how much should be debt and how much should be cash, we believe cash should make up 30% of that pie. So we want the pay as you go, or the cash portion to be 30% of that total, and we want the two of them together, debt and cash, to make up 30% of the total tax rate. That makes sense? All right. So if you look at the current tax rate, it's 74, 74 and three quarter cents. And that's how it breaks out between debt and capital. So let me go back to this. So then we had a bond program in 2018. And uh, we've been working on the next bond program that we had planned to do in 2022. We got to reevaluate that as we come out of this COVID thing. But we're working internally on what the next bond program is. And again, to me, that's important. If we're growing, we'll probably have a bond referendum every four years because the infrastructure will be needed for that growth. And the most cost effective way to pay for that infrastructure, much of this infrastructure will last longer than 20 and 30 years, is to debt finance it over time. The other thing to our favor right now is, I think, I don't believe interest rates have ever been this low in my entire career in local government. And Reggie, right there, our finance guy, you'd agree, right? All right. So the other thing that we do is we simply forecast at that with the city council and all I'm sharing with you is historical property tax revenue growth. And you can see what it's been doing the last few years. It's very strong. And we've, at that time, projected 4% going forward. But the other reason to go back in time is to look. There are times when that property tax revenue went backwards. The 10-11 recession. So values actually declined from one year to the next to where the city collected less property tax in that year. That may be our near, near future because of this COVID, and I'll talk more about that. Sales tax, same thing, we use 4%. That's been a safe bet for a number of years, but the same thing can happen with sales tax. And it did. It happened this year again. We will collect $11 million less, currently projecting, in sales tax than what we thought we would collect at the beginning of this year. So it can back up. This is hard to read. I'm not going to go through every line. But what we do at the city council is we identify all those things we know about for multiple years, right? So you'll see in a line up there that had the race and culture implementation, there was a lot of money we put into the current year budget regarding the race and culture implementation. We know that pension is still a problem and part of our fix that we approved two years ago includes more contributions from the city or taxpayers and more contributions for employees that kick in in 2022 and 2023. So some of that money, if it's there, has already been obligated. You'll see toward the bottom, Fire Station 45, the North Animal Shelter, the Far Southwest Library. Those are in the process of being built. When we finish that animal shelter, that requires 29 employees to operate the North Animal Shelter once it's open. Similar to the fire station that's being built, Station 45, which is in North Fort Worth off of Harmon Road somewhere, I think. All this is intended to show is we try to telegraph 
the commitments that have already been made, right, and how that will stack up against the revenue that we think might be out there in the future. And so we simply then look at that over a period of time. Now, you can disregard this slide because none of this stuff is going to come true anymore. And before I get into that, why don't I stop there and just see if there's. If anybody has a question, just raise your hand and we'll give you the microphone so people can hear it on the TV. Hi, um, I have a question on going back to budget policies and philosophies. Um, I saw maintain or reduce property tax rate. I think there was some criticism in the past because Although we reduced the tax rate, property values increased pretty significantly, and so overall property tax collection also increased. So I was just curious, is that being adjusted to account for what has happened in the past, or I, just to give us a more holistic view, I guess? So let's go here on the property tax revenue. So let's take 19, because 20 is not going to come true. So let's take last year. The revenue grew 7.7%. So we dropped the tax rate a certain amount. Right? But if your value went up more than the tax rate got adjusted down, you ended up paying more in property tax revenue. There's no, no getting around that. Right? If your value went down and the tax rate was down, you pay less in property tax revenue. Right, if and it's a law of averages, right? So it simply was in Tarrant County, the average was maybe seven percent. So if you went up eight percent, you're paying more in taxes. If your value only went up five, you might have got a break a little bit. And I don't have an easy way to sugarcoat that. So yes, in many cases, when you think about it, we brought in seven point seven percent more tax revenue, right? That year, even though the tax rate got adjusted down more. Um, does you and your staff, when you're planning and forecasting um, the budget, do you plan for different scenarios, like a, a downturn in the economy or a high case or obviously the current case? Yeah. So we're going to talk about this year because it's a real life example. But one of the reasons of doing history like that and through a business cycle or a couple business cycles is to teach yourself that 7% growth year over year it's not sustainable forever, right? Things are going to happen that you've got to then plan for. What happens if that doesn't happen? And unfortunately, we have a real life example right now. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, it's a real, I mean, it's a real kick in the gut on some of these things. So when you go back to those obligations that we made, we have to think about, well, maybe we don't, maybe we design the Southwest Library, we don't build it. Right now. We're too far along on the animal shelter, so that is going to be finished, and we're going to have to operate it. But maybe we slow some other things down so we don't incur the operating expenses when we're not going to be able to. The other thing in the context of today's time, right, we went, I, I go back to January or February. The economy couldn't have been stronger in Fort Worth. Right? The development is going strong. Unemployment's at 3% in Fort Worth. Right? The development is strong. Business is strong. Stock market was almost at 30,000, if I remember. And then we have a pandemic. Unemployment goes from 3% to 15%. Businesses shut down. Some will never reopen. I have you think about value of retail. Will those property values go up or down next year? Office space. Will office space property values go up or down next year? What would you bet on? Right? What does that do to the property tax revenue then? Right? And so that's what we've got to prepare for now. Right? I think those values are going to be stagnant or go down. 
right? You can go in as a property owner now. You own the building that has bird in it. It's vacant. You think that value went up or down? It went down. Right? Just like the office towers, if their vacancy went from 30% vacancy to 70% vacancy, those values are going to go down. And so we're going to have to adjust to that in the budget. That's not any fun, by the way. Um, I know we touched on surpluses getting moved to a reserve. Um, I was just curious. I know you said that uh, departments overspending is not appreciated, but do departments have an incentive to underspend so that that money can be re reallocated and dollars are efficiently spent? Well, I, I like to think compliments from the city manager are incentives for the department heads. <laughs> uh, because it is something we encourage. We don't want you to spend just because it's in your budget, right? So we do try to watch those things, that, and we watch patterns and do those things. And I'll talk about what we've had to do this year, right, because that will give a real example of what we had to put together to bring the budget in. So, all right. So a little bit on process before we get to the current year and what next year looks like. And you heard me say a little bit, to me the budget is not an event, right? Yeah, we got to do it every year. The council has to approve it. They got to set the property tax rate. So legally they got to do all those things. But financial management has to occur all the time, right? You just don't show up and say, hey, let's put a budget together and hope it's the right amount of money in the right places to deliver the right results. There's usually a little bit more to that, right? It, it's what are outcomes are we going to try to achieve? What project schedule? So when you do a capital project, right, you build a scope, you have a schedule, you have a budget. And we evaluate scope, budget, schedule. Well, it's similar to other things in the operating side of the budget, right? How many people does it take a staff a fire station? not rocket science. How many people, crews do we need to maintain the city streets at the level that we're shooting for? How many street lights, what's our replacement level or maintenance level for street lights across the city and are we hitting it? What's our pavement marking schedule so we could drive around the city safely because all the stripings are accurate and they're uh, visible and we have enough that aren't visible, right? So all those things get factored into a process of a budget and accountability because it's in both delivering services, delivering infrastructure, and trying to do that for 900,000 people and growing. And so when we think about budget, I don't think about it as an event, right? We do things throughout the year with the people in this room to, okay, the year just ended. What did spending look like? How good at, were we at estimating the revenues? Where can we improve on both of those things? Right? And then Reggie puts together a certified annual report that goes to the city council and also importantly the rating agencies who are going to rate the city's financial management ability so when we go to the market and sell bonds, we can get them at the uh, lowest interest rates. And that benefits everybody in this room and all the citizens. Right, so to me, budgeting and financial management is not about an event. It's an ongoing process that occurs throughout the year, and it's got to have some accountability with it. We've just put some of this up there to show you. you know, we start working with departments you know, as soon as the fiscal year end closes to see what we learned from the prior fiscal year. Then a couple months later, we're going to get with the departments because they're going to start building their budgets for the upcoming year. And then we work with the stakeholders groups, and then we ultimately, it's my responsibility to recommend the budget to the city council in August. And a few years ago, we broke that up, so we do the capital budget first, and we talk about the tax rate, and then we follow up the following week and we talk about the operating budget. The council always has budget work sessions that are open to the public. 
Uh, we always have public hearings that are part of council meetings that are related to the budget, and there's three with the upcoming uh, budget. This year we're talking about doing some virtual meetings. If the council wants to have virtual meetings in some of their district to talk about what's in the recommended budget, we're, we're going to do those. So there'll be more information on that as we step through the budget. But essentially, when you think about it, we're at the point where I have a pretty good idea what's in the budget that's going to land on the council's table next Tuesday. And a pretty good idea of what's in the budget, what's going to be on the table the following Tuesday when we talk about the operating budget. And then we swing the public input process, even though I would argue that it's going on throughout the year, but then there's mechanisms for input, feedback as part of that. And the council, before the end of September, has to approve the budget and the tax rate. So we've currently got that scheduled for 22nd, September 22nd. So that's a high level of the budget. But another thing, just to point out, it's also up there, is we do that planning retreat also every February with the council so we could kind of telegraph some of the stuff that we are thinking about and know about. So let's talk about, if you, it's not a lot of fun, but we'll talk about it. So things have changed. Uh, I described what January felt like when the stock market was at 30,000, unemployment was at 3%, and all that. Um, when the economy shut down in mid-March, right, the stay-at-home order, restaurants had to close, bars had to close, many uh, businesses uh, either had employees working from home or not coming into the office. So uh, the two revenues hardest hit by that happening was sales tax and hotel tax. And the hotel tax didn't affect the general fund, right? but it did affect the convention center and the Will Rogers. And we had to furlough 78, 78 employees because there was no business at the convention center, and there is no business at Will Rogers. You've now seen some of the hotels come back kind of, right? They actually shut down. Omni shut down. I, I don't think they reopened until the golf tournament in June, right? And they're back at some capacity now, but a lot of the hotels never reopened. So the hotel revenue is really impacting the convention center and the Will Rogers Complex. Now, the Will Rogers Complex is having some events if they're at low numbers, uh, but there hadn't been an event at the convention center since March. So when you think about the businesses downtown that also depended on the convention center business, all that went away as well. So then that takes us to the sales tax revenue. So, And as I mentioned, we will collect at least 11 million less this year than we thought about. So now, in property tax, I kind of foreshadowed what property tax is not going to affect us in the upcoming budget, maybe a little bit. My concern is the year after, when building owners will be able to, I think, have data to support values going in the other direction. And that will mean property tax revenues will be less than what we expected. So this is just to give you a visual of sales tax. The forecast that we use in February is the blue line. So the red line is we know we've lost at least 11 million for the year. Let's assume we might come back at 4% growth. We're still created a gap between what we thought we would have and what we will have. Property tax, 
a little more troubling. The blue line again is the February forecast, and the red line is what we think that might look like. And again, we'll test that again throughout all the fiscal years as we move forward. So we put a higher, in, well, let me give you numbers in the general fund. So the general fund budget was roughly, and this includes pay-as-you-go money. So this includes cash funding of capital. It was at 773 at the beginning of the year. We believe now that the number we have to hit is 750. So we had to take 23 million out of the expenditure side. That makes sense for the current year. <clears throat> One positive thing. We got 158 million dollars from the federal government and the CARES Act. But it could only be used, it can't be used for lost revenue. So it could only be used for expenditure, stuff you have spent money on, right, in response to COVID. So the city has a workforce of almost 7,000 people. So during COVID, some employees got shifted from their job Right, which might, let's take Brandon Bennett, who is the head of our code compliance department, and he becomes the public health official during COVID. His salary now is eligible for the CARES Act funding. Does that make sense? Right? So before his expenditure came out of the general fund, now it comes out of the CARES fund. So we're able to offset some of our costs with the CARES money. So that helps with this 23 million gap that we've created, or that got created from the revenue. The other thing we did, and this is a short-term, one-year strategy, we shifted some of the stuff that we were going to use cash for and did short-term tax notes, a debt financing scheme, in order to pay for those projects through tax notes as opposed to cash. So it spreads out the payments over a longer period of time, reducing the amount of money that we have to come up in the current fiscal year. And then departments identified four to six million of savings, did I get that number right, in the current year. And we've had a hiring freeze in place since March. Right? Now we're allowing some positions to get filled. Right, they all get evaluated by the city manager's office. If they fill, we're allowing almost entirely only internal recruiting because it'll create a vacancy somewhere else, right? which I think we're going to need over a longer period of time to reduce the size of the workforce to bring the expenditures in line of what the future revenues are going to look like. So the conversation we've been having internally in the city is, this isn't just about the fiscal year 21 budget. This is about the fiscal year 21 budget and what it needs to do to set up the fiscal year 22 budget, which I think will be harder. Right? And if you saw the numbers, fiscal year 23 may even be harder, unless there's a much faster rebound on the economy. So as we've said earlier on, the, the budget's not a one-year event. You got to think about this over a longer period of time. And so we're trying to set up the budget in 21, right? Not just for 21, but for 22 and 23. So <clears throat> the budget that you'll see next week, both on the capital side, our uh, assessed value is only growing, it's growing less than four. So even our forecast numbers would have been off. And that's not even adjusting for the what might be the decline in value. Right? New growth is still pretty strong, but the, the tax, tax district numbers for current values and appreciating or not appreciating, they were essentially flat year over year. They didn't decline, so I'm not complaining, but they'll essentially stay flat. Um, 
and the 21 budget, just looking forward, if you think back to that forecast we gave just back in February, so it wasn't that long ago. We've got to take 18 million out of what we thought was going to be available. So some of those commitments get pushed off. We're going to keep the hiring freeze in place probably across the next fiscal year as well because we've got to be able to generate some of those vacancies that will occur at the time. Here again is a uh, little more detail on this point forward. The same conversation that we're having tonight, we're replicating on Friday. Um, we'll present the capital budget on the 4th, the operating budget on the 11th. In August and September, we'll be uh, working with council members that want to have virtual meetings, different parts around the city, we'll do those. We have the work session scheduled on those dates that you see there. And then we have the public hearings, which are part of the city council meetings on September 1st, 15th, and the 22nd. Questions? You have some on? Um, oh, now it's on. We have um, quite a few that have come in through email and text messages and phone calls. So um, we're going to get through those as quickly as we can. Um, the police and fire departments use about 60% of the general fund with the remaining 40% for all other services. How does that proportion stack up against other cities our size? I'd say it's pretty similar based on what I have seen. You know, you know I've heard some elected officials say, do you, do you know where all the property tax revenue goes? That goes to police and fire. In fact, if you look at the property tax revenue slice of the pie, it's smaller than the amount of money that goes to police and fire. But I do think it is, we can get that data too, because we do that as part of the annual budget. We'll have some of our peer cities, which will show you San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, Houston, and in, by my memory, I think we're fairly similar to most of those cities. Why is the budget increased every year? Is it solely based on growth? And what economic indicators go into that decision? I think we covered some of that. It, it's not this year, right? And so when you think about, we've had strong property tax revenue growth over the last four years, four or five years. And I think the economy reflected that too. And so did the tax bills that got sent to folks. But each of those years, the last four years, the tax rate also came down. Maybe not, this, not down enough to offset the entire increase, um, but the budget has been growing year over year. What we've seen in the current year is the budget actually went down by 23 million, and we expect property tax revenues to be relatively flat over the next two years, so that's not always a given. What role does do the council members play in the budget process, or is it left up to the budget office and staff? Well, I think whoever asked that question got a better feel, uh, because I think it's a participatory process throughout the year. I mean, I think I get feedback from citizens all the time, right? I would imagine so do the other people in the manager's office, and I imagine the council members uh, do as well. And I, I don't, I would say the council members wait for the budget to express where they think needs are or where we got to allocate more resources. And I think it still comes back to it's a budget process that, uh, you know, like I said, in the general fund, if you spend a dollar in neighborhood services, it's not a dollar that's now available for something else, right? So th that's all about choices and trade offs. Did I? Did I get at that question? That you kind of leads into the next question, which is how are city services prioritized for funding? Is it based on programs and the most residents served? That's a, that's a great question because we wrestle with that all the time. Well, we, we do it at a couple different levels. We do a citizen survey every two years, right? And citizen survey will identify 
in broad categories how they feel about the delivery of city services. And if I remember, um, usually the stuff that comes out on top from it has to do with the level of our sh street maintenance. Does anybody else remember what's in the some of those top things? Street maintenance, I think, comes out traffic. So we, one way is to do the citizen survey. We also ask departments to prioritize their services because in reality, not everything is equally important, right? And everybody can kind of prioritize their level of services. And so when you think about, if you had to look at where you're gonna reduce things in a department, you look at what those low priority items, I'm not a believer in across the board cuts, because that cuts important stuff the same as unimportant stuff. So I believe we ought to prioritize stuff and look at the stuff that's at the lowest priority and see if we could just stop doing that entirely, as opposed to across the board, again, which I think affects services which are important just as much as those that we might not think are as important. When will a draft copy of the budget be available online for our review? The capital will be online on Tuesday, August 4th, and the operating Tuesday, August 11th, right? Both, both, well, the recommendation on the capital will be out there on the 4th. Okay. All right. When the budget is to be considered by the City Council, will there be agenda items on the various sections to facilitate consolidated presentations and comments? So usually what we'll do is we will try to identify what we think the issues are in the upcoming budget. So we don't, I don't want to say this, in. We don't parade every department in to make their pitch, right? It's the manager's responsibility to take what all the departments bring to the table, how you balance the tax rate with infrastructure, with operating, with, you know, is there a pay increase in there for employees and all those things that you have to do the choices and trade-offs. So what I would say is we then identify the issues in the upcoming budget that we believe have some interest and then try to have those as an agenda at some of the work sessions. I can guess on some of these things. I think we'll talk about transit. Because I think transit had a $10 million request out there to the city, right? I don't think that's a secret. And they've tried to mobilize people to comment to the manager's office, comment to city council members. So I'm just guessing transit might be one of those issues. And I think police funding, both in the general fund and the CCPD fund, will, will be an item for discussion. Uh, and they'll be, I'm just using those as examples. So what we'll try to do is identify the issues that we're aware of and that uh, the, the council wants to have some dialogue and some conversation about. And then we talk about, does that change what's in the recommended budget? What do we trade off if we want to do more in a certain area? So that's kind of, I think, how we'll handle that as we go forward. How much of the funding will be allocated to grassroots community organizations? I'm assuming that is related to CCPD funding. And so what do you think, CCPD funding question? Uh, so I think we'll cover that on the operating budget uh, presentation on the 11th, and I imagine that will have a lot of conversation around that after. Well, that's right. What is the, uh, go ahead. So we're having a special workshop related to yes, several um, areas around police reform and diversity and inclusion on the 14th of August in the afternoon. It'll be both, you can attend virtually or uh, in the work session this, for the city council. And it'll include the proposed CCPD um, budget, including a breakout of how much will be available for community um, partners. It'll also include um, an update from the 
police monitor's office um, on their schedule for that going forward. It'll include an update on the Race and Culture Task Force initiatives um, that have been ongoing. It'll include a presentation on the city's um, diversity procurement or um, what we call the MWB ordinance for procurement. Uh, now it's a diversity and inclusion uh, business <coughs> ordinance. And it will also include um, the um, presentation on it's the last one, Fernando, that I'm missing. That's right, the municipal equity plan. So with the creation of the diversity and inclusion department, uh, we're going through a process where every department in the city ultimately is going to have a diversity and equity plan tied to that department. Uh, the first department to start that process would be our transportation public works department. And it's being led in, co in, in cooperation with the diversity and inclusion office. Um, so there'll be a presentation on how that's going to roll forward and how that, that'll move forward. So all those items will be in the afternoon of the, the 14th. I believe it's a one, from 1, no, 12.30 to 4.30. Yeah, we need to include that on our slide, too. So. We'll add that. Okay. Um, I think this next question also probably falls in line <coughs> with that CCPD um, budget information that will be shared on the 14th. But... It's, will there be more funding allocated to mental health training for the police and community? The short answer, yes. The details will be provided on the 14th. And um, I think this has been covered, but maybe just to, to expand on it, how are you implementing and soliciting community involvement and input into the budget? Well, this may be repetitive, Again, what I'd say is we want to encourage that throughout the year. And one way we get that is also through the multiple advisory committees that work with the different departments. And that stakeholder process that we had, it wasn't just the advisory committees. We were also working with neighborhood groups and whoever wanted to participate. And so we'll probably try to reinvigorate that stakeholder process just because it is a forum that allows us to do just what we're doing right now. You know, I get to share information, I get to hear questions, and that's all part of the budget process as well. How does the city justify the golf courses and Spinks Airport? Is there really enough use of either to truly justify spending dollars to maintain or enhance them? So I've learned in a few years in the business that Try to close a golf course. Try to close a library. Try to close a rec center. So where we can think, oh, that can't be that important. It is important to somebody. Sphinx Airport. There are a lot of hangars, a lot of people that fly out of Sphinx. Uh, Sphinx actually doesn't, it doesn't lose money. I won't say it's a money winner, but, but it, the city property taxpayers, sales tax is not going into Sphinx Airport. So the revenue they're able to get from the users of Sphinx is covering the cost of Sphinx. We have closed two, actually. The Sycamore, the eight, uh, nine hole. Who was the other one? What was the other one? Oh, Zebo, yeah. Can line item, but can line item budgets be published along with the PDF? on the website. So I'll, we'll put anything on the website. I don't know how a line item budget will help somebody. Because it doesn't tell you what that department is trying to accomplish. It'll tell you what they're spending out of line items, but it won't tell you what programs and services they're doing or uh, what they're trying to accomplish. But yes, we can put line item budgets on the website. And then the next question also has to do with um, sharing information. Can budget versus actuals be shared on a quarterly basis, potentially um, through open data? And I would say the answer is no reason that can't happen. Um, I, didn't make, I didn't make eye contact with Reggie and Terry. But <laughs> of course that could happen. Um, how much of a variance is deemed material with quotation marks? 
for example, Fort Worth PD 2020 budget is 267 million. Line item budget shows 270 million. That's, we'll have to follow up okay, on that one. We'll follow up on that one. Um, Let's take one in here. We'll come back in a minute. Okay. Just want to say thank you. It was an excellent presentation. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, with public safety uh, getting a huge portion of the city's budget, um, do we ever consider um, using those funds? Uh, I mean, I don't know if any of the organizations have ever thought about community policing. Um, you know, I'm thinking that, you know, a lot of the citizens seem to be unsatisfied with the services. And with so much money going to that, uh, I'm thinking that there may be better outcomes using folks right from the community who could possibly assist or almost even better police people in those communities. Um, I also wanted to ask how much uh, funding is in the CCPD fund? Because if those are the funds that we're looking at uh, using for uh, community projects, that's still a whole lot of uh, funding in the general fund for public safety that, you know, that's we need to kind of consider. And also my last question is uh, properties that the city may own that are uh, maybe just breaking even or uh, not getting the maximum bang does the city ever consider uh, selling any of those properties? So let me do the last one first. Yes. So if we're not going to keep that property for a public use, park, open space, or a facility that we plan to build, we want it back on the tax roll, right? Because otherwise it's simply a maintenance cost for us and it's not generating any revenue. So it's in our best interest to put that property on the tax roll, eliminate our maintenance costs and generate some revenue. The other two questions that I think are about uh, at CCPD, one is the amount in the, even though the sales tax has gone down, it's still about 70 million. And so that's CCPD, so it's another 70, say 79 million. Um, and I think what the question you had about uh, the community, other ways of spending that money, I think that's what you'll be hearing about uh, partly on August 11th when we talk about the CCPD budget and then also on the August 14th piece because I do think there is a lot of interest in the community of can we spend more money on community programs? Are, there, are we going to do more in the mental health area or the crisis intervention team? So I think some of that will be addressed uh, when we deal with the CCPD budget. Out of the um, 59 positions to be eliminated for 2021, how many of those are coming from full-time positions rather than part-time or entry-level positions? Here's what I love about that question. I don't even know what the number is, <laughs> right? Which means somebody's got some information here. So, see, there are no secrets in, uh, in government. Ask me the question again. See, I lost track since... <clears throat> Out of the 59 but, positions to be eliminated for 2021, how many of those are coming from full-time positions rather than part-time or entry-level positions? I don't know. I didn't know the number was 59. Uh, but it's a mix of full-time and part-time. We can, we'll have that out uh, when we present the budget on the 11th. And again, part, the other one, message I would want to share is, right, the positions we're eliminating, we're, try, we're trying to do it entirely through creating vacancies so we don't put people on the street, right? And so if we've identified a position, I, I'm assuming that most, if not all those 59, are vacant. But if they are occupied, right, we made a commitment to work with those employees 
in looking at other vacancies that exist in the city so that we can put them in those positions if they have the qualifications to do that job. Why does Fort Worth have the fourth lowest total budget per capita of any major U.S. city, especially if we have been continuously lowering our property taxes because they were too high? Um, this includes having a lower tax budget per capita than Texas cities like Houston, Dallas, and Austin. Well, see, I mean, so that's new data for me, too. <laughs> I'd like to see that data. I think that would be a great story, if that's true, to be able to share. Again, the tax rate going down didn't mean that our property tax revenues went down. In fact, our property tax revenues went up by those percentage amounts. So we were getting healthy increases in property tax revenue even as we reduced the property tax rate. So it's hard to correlate tax rate all the time with property tax revenue growth. How is the city budget decided among the other city departments? What or who determine who gets what and how much? Um, so I'd like to say it's a participatory process. But in the end, it's my responsibility to present the recommended budget. And the way the question was implied, uh, there really wasn't a lot of me uh, money to allocate to the different departments. And I will say this. There isn't a department that thinks they need less money to do what they've been asked to do. Right? Every department in the city I'm pretty confident, Fernando, Val, everybody, that they would want more money. But there isn't more money, right? So we've got to then prioritize how we're going to spend that money. And, and that list that you saw that telegraphed where we've made our commitments already is the first place we're going to look, because those are commitments we've made to the public, that we've got these things to do. And so, we try to involve the department heads in all those conversations because we don't want anything to sneak up on them. We share with them in, in this room often, right, here's where we are on the budget. So we had a conversation in this room last week. You know, was a pay increase even possible? So we could get some feedback from the department heads. And, and we talked in here last week about what vacancies are we willing, we collectively, your department head now, we collectively that we're willing to put on the table to uh, reduce the expenditure side of the city. So we try to do that in a participatory way. But in the end of the day, we try to figure out what the right balance is that we're going to recommend to the city council. Is it possible to implement a tiered property tax where residential properties valued above 250000 pay a higher property tax rate? I don't think that's legal, but we can follow <laughs> up on that. Now, there are homestead exemptions, right? And some are based on percentages, and some are based on total value, right? So if you have a lower-valued house and you have a total value exemption, that's a bigger proportional decrease. So sometimes it can be handled on the homestead exemption side as opposed to a tiered property tax rate. Senior freeze, over 65 freeze. So there are ways I think that's been accommodated, but not through a tiered property tax rate. Has the city ever considered zero-based budgeting rather than base budget, the base budget approach? Uh, Yes. I mean, I think we, there's many opposed ways to do budget. There's party-based budgeting, there's performance-based budgeting, there's zero-based budgeting. Uh, and I would like to think we incorporate all the best of those different ways of looking at it. And every now and then you do have to look at it from the zero base, where you start from scratch and see if you built it back up, whether you continue to do all those things that you've historically done. How are decisions made during the year to transfer money from one program or department to another? 
Um, ask that again. I, I want to make sure I get um, this. How are decisions made during the year to transfer money from one program or department to another? Uh, well, nobody has the authority to do that except me with notification to the city council. Or if it's a project and we're going to change an appropriation, only the city council can approve that. So it would come as a recommendation from the staff. Uh, but across departmental uh, allocations, I, I have the authority to do that, but only with notification to the council. Reggie, I get that right? not repeat. Um, does the hiring freeze across the next year include police? Uh, so yes, it'll include police civilian positions, uh, not civil service. Uh, those recruiting classes take six months, 12 months to put into place. And the same would be on the fire side, although I think fire has a current recruitment class in but it would apply to civilian positions in both police and fire. Um, Follow-up question to an earlier question. If a line item budget isn't helpful in understanding what initiatives are being funded, what's the best approach for the public to, to get that understanding? Uh, I would like to think that the, the budget we prepare that has programmatic descriptions of what the department is trying to do is a better high-level description of, again, what the department is trying to achieve and perhaps how they're organized in order to get that function done. To me, a line item budget is simply going to show you how much money we spend on salaries and benefits, office supplies, training. So I don't know that it gives you a sense of how the department is organized. I don't think it gives you a sense, but it tells you it's a very finite number. And we use line items simply to control how money is allocated and spent from an accounting system standpoint. What will we do with the 2021 budget if we are still in a pandemic? Will we have to cut back on city services? Yes. There's some of these who are, they're very, very specific, and I think, like, we'll get the information, but um, I don't know that it's. Yeah, I should have said that whatever questions come in, that if they're tied to a specific, we're going to put the question and the answer. Put everything online. So. On, the, on our website, online, so that people can see what the questions are, and just the ones that we have asked here, too, that, that have more detail to it, we'll put that information online. So hypothetically, let's say I had a great idea for a transportation project. What would you say is the most productive use of my time to maybe like get that project, you know, pitched to somebody who can get on a budget, or how can I get more involved? So it's a transit project. Is it something that the city? So I'm just this is part of what we'd explore. Is it something that Trinity Metro is responsible for? So is it a bus route, or is it related to? Uh, what we're calling the zip zone services, which is like an Uber type thing in a certain area. Uh, we're trying to do as many of those pilot programs with Trinity Metro. And so we have somebody that works with Trinity Metro. And they put forward, as you know, a $10 million request to the city. Some of that stuff that I, I, I look at that and I say, uh, like sidewalks, right? That we should have sidewalks to bus stops. Well, that's makes so that's obvious, right? City's responsible for sidewalks, so you know maybe we ought to add more money into the budget so we're able to complete more sidewalks to bus stops, and that might be our contribution because we don't run the bus system, we don't run the train system, but one of the things that we are responsible for is sidewalks. So I would try to figure out who's responsible for that and then try to steer you in that direction. <coughs> So you talked about citizens advisory committee, so and the stakeholder process and all that stuff. So what 
what does that look like? I mean, what has that looked like in the past? You know, you talked about neighborhoods being involved in this. Like, what, you know, because obviously right now we're having meetings like this, um, and there's more, you know, more is coming, more questions are being asked. So I, I'm just like, what citizens are on the advisory committee? What neighborhoods are being involved and that kind of stuff? Uh, so I'm just so not this past year because we didn't do it, but in the years before, so we tried to identify all the advisory committees that work with city departments and give them the opportunity to participate participate in the budget process from really the February time frame through September when the council approves it. Over time, there were more than advisory committees. There were other groups that found out their meetings. So some that represented neighborhoods, some that represented the Realtors Association, some that maybe represented the Real Estate Council or the Home Builders. Um, and you know, we didn't turn anybody away that wanted to participate. And it, the way I described it, it was simply sharing information in real time, right? So in February, I'd say, here's what we're sharing with the city council related to the forecast. Here's our obligations. Here's what we're thinking about the CCPD. Here's what we're thinking about the general fund. So we're simply doing it in real time. Right? So, and people got to participate and ask questions. And, and so at this point in time in the year, right, I'd meet with the stakeholder group and essentially telegraph what I'm going to talk about next Tuesday and the following Tuesday. Right? So they had a chance to hear about it to give some feedback, to share that they think certain things are important to that group. And so I, I, what I'm, I guess, trying to share is, you know, I want to get back to that conversation to it's more ongoing and it's not exclusive, right? It's intended to be inclusive, whoever wants to participate. I will say, like, for the neighborhood representatives, um, we had a lot of the alliances, the, um, the presidents um, from the different alliances were on that last stakeholders group that we did last year. So just to follow up, just because I am a president of a neighborhood association, and so that's, that's why I asked that question. <laughs> and so because my neighborhood, you know, is is a large area um you know i know the city doesn't exclude anybody uh i would hope not but like the the amount of information and the you know the swimming that you gotta do through the information and stuff like that like obviously you know we're getting people are asking questions now about stuff that you know we get the response that it's always been public you know there's been meetings and stuff like that so if the process like is there is there something that y'all are looking to to get those neighborhoods that, you know, if there is development in that certain kind of area, you know, that I reach, I know Brenda and Ruth and Catherine Huckabee are amazing at what they do, but like, you know, it the way that things have been obviously has led us to the point where we are now where people are asking so many questions. So is the city seeing on different ways of engaging neighborhoods that maybe possibly, possibly haven't been as engaged in the past. And I know the community engagement office does a good job. Again, they do a good job at, but just, you know, cause we have, you know, these citizen advisory committees and the stakeholder meetings and stuff like that. So be more, even more inclusive than we have been in the past. So that's- I think, I think that's our takeaway too, that we've got to figure out how to do more of that. There's no reason for us to keep this information to ourselves. I mean, there's, and so creating these forms where we could say, hey, here's what it looks like. It's not that pretty, right? And here's what we're struggling with. There's no reason to keep that to ourselves. Right? And I think we'd be better off if more people participate in that conversation. I'm just piggybacking off the gentleman's question. When the information is put out uh, more inclusive to the underserved populations, and just like this uh, 14th of August uh, meeting, it wasn't publicized, and the times are not conducive for a working population to be in attendance to participate. So you have a 12.30 to 4.30 on the 14th of August, which we're just made abreast of, but how do you expect regular citizens, working day citizens, to participate 
in these when you set them at those specific times. They need to be more inclusive to the working populations or time sets and to be more inclusive for those populations. I'll take that feedback. Did you have any others? We were scheduled to go to 8. There is no reason. Do we have to stay till 8 unless you want to? And I'll stay here the whole time. Um, are there any plans to host more, um, I guess what I would call educational sessions? I think there are many members of the public who don't even understand uh, what a bond program is, how credit uh, rating agencies affect that. Um, do you guys have any intentions of helping uh, citizens to better understand all the impacts that go that affect your budget? We'd be happy to do that. So the answer is yes. How we incorporate that into, I think you have an idea what it looks like over the next few months, but then we need to figure out a way to do that throughout the year as well. And I will say that like we're always, especially through Catherine's group and the community engagement team, we're always looking for ways to engage all of the residents and um, that could be a challenge sometimes because obviously we go to the electronic because that's free and when we start to do mailings and outreach which could, which could reach a larger audience it gets very very expensive but if you all have ideas or groups that we can partner with to get the information out definitely I mean let myself know you can come and give me your email address um, or reach out to Catherine and her team because they already do such a great job of working with neighborhoods. But um, we're always looking for different ways to not just push out information, but also have that two-way conversation so that we can get the input and find out where we need to do a better job. This is my last question. So um, is this presentation, uh, I don't know how to broadcast this, broadcasted, um, but is this going to be in Spanish? We are adding Spanish subtitles to the video, and it will be posted on YouTube. Thank you. Yeah. So just to clarify on the 14th, so that that is a council work session. Mm -hmm. So if anybody's free to attend and watch it, there's not going to, when you have a work session, so city council meetings, either a city council meeting, or you have public comment available or a work session where it's just the city council that speaks. It will be televised and it will be recorded. So if you can't be there to watch what goes on, the city council presentations that are done and the city council discussion and that kind of thing, it'll be online available you know, on the city's website to be able to watch it at a later, you know, that evening or the next day. The idea is that the city council is gonna be seeing this information for the first time then also. They're gonna have questions, they're gonna have have their ideas of, of what's being presented and recommended by, by city staff. And those decisions will be part of the budget process, right? So during the budget process, where we have the different dates that were shown for citizen input, the budget hearings, that's where you can come and make comment directly in public, or you can contact your council member directly or the mayor's office or whomever between then and the 22nd of September to give your feedback based on what you saw just for that meeting, for instance, or any of the meetings as you go along. So I just wanted to clarify that, that it is, it is a work session, it is during the day, but it, it's a work session for the city council to have the discussion and it will be available online for you to watch it whenever you, you can. So. Is for them to discuss it afterwards? But the, I so think the 11th is the overall budget. Operating budget. It would be, it'd just be a presentation on the overall budget, kind of big picture. On the 14th will be those specific items that I mentioned that will be presented. And then the council will have ongoing, as David said, different meetings throughout August. When they have their meetings, they're going to get different pieces of the budget because it's too much to take in, right? Those things with the highest, most interest will be presented as you go along. So, throughout Those are are the, those open to the public? Yes, those, and are, those budget, are public hearings. Those are council meetings, and they'll have, we'll have a budget hearing where anybody can talk about any items in the budget at that time. They can sign up. Yeah, you can also come during the regular council meetings in August and make comments about what you've seen in this presentation. Just 
kind of to reiterate what her question was um at those meetings is it going to have the same rules as the city council like if i ask a question are they going to actually be able to answer me but so city council meetings that's where we take citizen input the work right. session does not have citizen input right well my question is this um at a city council meeting uh traditionally they have items on the agenda and the only times that the city council is supposed to be able to respond to you is with items on that agenda and then you have general comments that the city council's not allowed to respond to so are those questions going to be treated as general comments where the, the city council won't respond or will they be treated as agenda items where where the city council will respond and actually get some some actual collaboration in these sessions going so typically if you're asking a specific question about the budget that's being recommended during the budget hearing our budget officer will answer the question on that budget question if you're soliciting an opinion from a council member that's their right whether or not they're going to answer you or not it's up to them. Right? well I'm, I'm just asking if the decision makers are going to be able to answer us if we ask them I mean, if they'd, if they'd like to. Again, there's a, there's a difference in the questions, right? If you're asking a question about the budget issue, mm -hmm. a specific budget item. Would that be for the budget will, officer? Well, the staff will answer that question. I, so I've seen all sorts of questions, right, asked of, of city council members, whether or not they'll answer that question or not. It'll be up to that individual. Yeah, there's no reason. Yeah. Okay, thank you. States, we need to have more citizen input in those decision making processes, not once it's done, but in between. So, what I'm right, so you can come to the budget choice. meeting and, and sign up and provide your input on what what changes you'd like to see on the budget. And that's the, fir the first, the 15th, and the 22nd of September are the budget hearings where we'll be able to ask questions in regards to what's being proposed and make comments of, or recommendations right. on what's being proposed. Or in any council meeting, you could, you could sign up in the citizen comments and provide your comments on what you'd like to see. During the month of August and September. Okay, that's my clarification. So that will be for the citizen input. And I'm sorry, I'm Gina with the NAACP. Any final questions? Michelle? We good on those? I think we're good. I mean, there are some that are very specific, and we'll like it. But like we'll I said, all the questions and the answers, we'll be posting those online so everybody can see them. So we're going to do this again on Friday at 10. Is that right? Is that yes. time right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to encourage others to be able to participate in that time or watch it, we'll be doing something very similar that we did here. I want to thank you for taking your time this evening, both those that are here in the room with us and those that are watching it from somewhere else. I do appreciate you taking the time out and, and joining us for the conversation on the budget. With that, I'll say we're through for the evening. Everybody have a good night.